In pouring tropical rain, Pipe Major Stephen Small, 1st Battalion, the Black Watch, stood at attention, playing on his bagpipes a sad lament, appropriately named the Immortal Memory. Drawn up before a huge crowd stood a company from the Black Watch, the RAF Regiment's Queen's Colour Squadron and a contingent of Royal Navy sailors. The date was the 30th of June 1997, the last day of British rule in Hong Kong before its transfer to the People's Republic of China. For the British military, it was closing day. Most of the units that formed Hong Kong's garrison had already departed or been disbanded. The four regiments of Gurkhas had been amalgamated in 1994 into the Royal Gurkha Rifles and split between bases in England and Brunei. The Gurkha training wing in Hong Kong had also closed in 1994 and found a new home at Church Crookham in Hampshire. The brigade's support units, the Queen's Gurkha Engineers, the Queen's Gurkha Signals and the Queen's Own Gurkha Logistic Regiment had been drastically cut and the surviving squadrons transferred to the UK. Responsibility for guarding the border had been handed over to the Royal Hong Kong Police, itself shortly to lose its illustrious prefix. The same year that the Gurkhas amalgamated, the colony's dedicated Army Air Corps unit, 660 Squadron, was redeployed elsewhere. 28 Army Cooperation Squadron RAF flew the last British military helicopters in Hong Kong until shortly before the handover in 1997. The successor unit to the famed Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps, which had fought so courageously in the defence of the colony in December 1941 against the Japanese, was the Royal Hong Kong Regiment, the Volunteers. They were stood down for the last time in 1995 after 141 years of unbroken service. The Hong Kong Military Service Corps, the only unit of the regular British Army that recruited among the local Chinese population, survived until 1997, until disbanded. There were many sad parades, followed by the laying up of colours and speeches of thanks and remembrance. A feeling of finality was everywhere, tinged with uncertainty about the future, post-1997. Hong Kong had been an important Royal Naval base for 156 years, but that came to an abrupt halt on the 11th of April 1997, when HMS Tamar, no longer a ship but what the Navy called a stone frigate, was decommissioned at Stonecutters Island in a moving ceremony attended by the First Sea Lord. The three Peacock-class patrol ships, the 6th Patrol Craft Flotilla, HMS Peacock, Plover and Starling, would remain in Asia after the handover, sold for just $20 million to the Philippines. The modern Prince of Wales building, headquarters of the British garrison in Hong Kong, was to have new tenants in the form of Chinese Communist troops who would cross the border into the territory at the stroke of midnight on the 30th of June 1997. The building's name would linger on until 2002, when it became the Chinese People's Liberation Army Forces Hong Kong Building, and the Royal Crest was removed. The last British Line Infantry Regiment to serve in Hong Kong, 1st Battalion, the Staffordshire Regiment, had departed in 1996. In 1997, Britain returned to China a territory of immense riches, an economic powerhouse and one of the world's most important port cities. It was an extraordinary transformation in just over 150 years, and the nation was rightly proud of what Hong Kong had become under British control. Its future as a special administrative region of China is less assured, but British values and practices have proved able to endure far beyond the handover, and Hong Kong still feels very different from mainland China. When Britain returned to Hong Kong in September 1945, shortly after the Japanese surrender, the colony was a shadow of its former self. The Japanese had stripped all of its assets, victimised and murdered its citizens, and imprisoned its administrators. Hong Kong had suffered from Allied bombing raids, food shortages, and much else besides. Its population had decreased dramatically, and its once famous manufacturing industries lay mostly silent. There was no guarantee that British sovereignty could be re-established in the immediate post-war period, but the British government moved fast, lest the nationalist Chinese annex the territory in the power vacuum after the defeat of Japan. 
a group of former british officials led by colonial secretary frank gimson had been in prison for three years and eight months in stanley prison a japanese civilian internment camp in hong kong on the 15th of August, the day Emperor Hirohito announced the surrender, the Japanese were still responsible for maintaining public order in the colony, which was a completely unsatisfactory situation. Sir Horace Seymour Conway, the British ambassador to nationalist China based in Chongqing, now Chongqing, sent a message to Gimson on the eve of the Japanese surrender. Gimson received instructions from Sir Horace, which came from the top in London, to exercise sovereignty on behalf of the British government, as the governor, Sir Mark Young, was still incommunicado in a Japanese prison camp in Manchuria. Gimson immediately left the prison, with all of the former colonial officials in tow, including the commissioner of the Royal Hong Kong Police, the director of public works, and other top officials, and speedily organised a provisional government. Gimson appointed himself acting governor in Sir Mark's absence. On the 27th of August, Gimson broadcast by radio to the people of Hong Kong, informing them that the provisional government was firmly in control and that orderly British rule had been re-established. Three days later, a Royal Navy flotilla led by Rear Admiral Cecil Harcourt sailed into Victoria Harbour, charged with taking the surrender of the Japanese occupation forces and forming a military government. Gimson handed over control to Harcourt, who briefly appointed him Lieutenant Governor, and the Navy remained in charge of the colony until Sir Mark Young returned from convalescing in England following his release from captivity. Over the next few years, the situation inside Hong Kong improved rapidly. New construction projects and a thriving manufacturing base fueled by cheap labour soon made Hong Kong an integral part of the world economy. By 1956, after a decade of peace, the garrison had been reduced to an internal security force. But on the 10th of October, double ten day to the Chinese, many local people were celebrating the 1911 October Revolution and the foundation of the Republic, and an officious British resettlement officer ordered Gomentang Chinese nationalist fags to be removed from buildings inside refugee camps. This sparked off anti-communist rioting as mobs rampaged through Kowloon, attacking properties belonging to communist sympathisers. There was no official intervention at this point as colonial officials hoped the violence would quickly burn itself out. By the following day, there were particularly violent attacks at Tsuen Wan, five miles from Kowloon. Gormantang's supporters stormed the clinic and welfare centre and four people were murdered. Others were hauled off to the nationalist headquarters and tortured. Chinese communist-owned factories were attacked and there were some brutal murders committed. In Kowloon, a foreign car was attacked and the Swiss consul's wife died from the injuries that she sustained. Colonial Secretary Edgeworth David now took action, and armoured cars of the 7th Queen's Own Hussars, based at Sekkong Camp, were deployed onto the streets, and the soldiers given orders to shoot rioters without hesitation. Communists were given sanctuary in police compounds, while the police and the army tried to contain the trouble. By the 12th of October, the riots had subsided. The rioters had murdered 15 people, while 44 troublemakers were shot dead by the police and army. Four rioters were later found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Peace was restored to Hong Kong. Garrison duty in Hong Kong between the 1950s and the handover was a much sought-after posting for British soldiers. Families could go with them, and the social, travel and shopping opportunities in Hong Kong were unrivaled anywhere else in the world at the time. Life was very pleasant, recalled a regimental historian. There was no need to be bored. A trip on the ferry to watch the world go by was of constant interest. Plenty of time for window shopping and meeting friends and taking meals out in Kowloon and in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a fun place full of colour and excitement. The nature of the duties performed by garrison battalions changed little between 1948 and 1997, but the challenges did as the People's Republic of China attempted various ways to disrupt life in Hong Kong.
It is not possible here to tell the stories of every single British battalion that served in Hong Kong during the post-war period, but what follows is a selection of experiences of individual units through the different decades, demonstrating both the unchanging nature of garrison life in the colony and also the duties and challenges faced by British soldiers. The 1st Battalion, the Queen's Royal Surrey Regiment, arrived in Hong Kong aboard the troop ship HMT Oxfordshire on the 5th of March 1962, following a tour of duty in Aden. At that time, the British garrison in Hong Kong consisted of only one British infantry battalion, supported by three battalions of 48th Gurkha Brigade, with a Royal Artillery Regiment at Gun Club Hill Barracks, Kowloon. The Queens were based at Stanley Barracks, the extreme southern end of Hong Kong Island, with a company outstationed at Lai Mun, overlooking Victoria Harbour. The first problem the Queens encountered was the extreme heat when they stepped off the ship. Being winter, the adjutant had ordered thick battle dress to be worn. It turned out that the temperature in Hong Kong that day was in the high 90s Fahrenheit with 100% humidity. So the next day olive green was adopted but just 24 hours later the temperature had dropped to 55 degrees, and the Stanley Peninsula gave a good imitation of Dartmoor in winter. The weather in Hong Kong is very fickle and changeable, presenting acclimatization challenges for freshly arrived troops. The men and their families were more than satisfied with Stanley Barracks. Built in the 1930s, they were among the best in the world, with an all-round view of the coastline, Beautiful trees and shrubs were planted round the buildings. C Company was detached and based at Limun Barracks, which it shared with various other units. This suited the men as they were nearer to the flesh pots of Wan Chai and, of course, further away from the management. The companies changed round every six months. The battalion was almost immediately called upon to perform ceremonial duties, an important part of garrison service in Hong Kong. The Queen's Birthday Parade was held in Kowloon on the 12th of April, followed by the battalion firing a feu de joie and beating retreat at Stanley Fort on the 2nd of May. On the 9th of May, 50 Chinese other ranks joined the Queen's. They were the first locally recruited Chinese soldiers to join a British Line Infantry Battalion, and they arrived just in time to replace the last batch of conscripted National Servicemen, who had completed their two years' service and were about to be discharged at the end of May. The Queen's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel M. A. Lowry, sent a message to Officer Commanding A Company informing him that he held the last national serviceman to leave the battalion, and should this not be marked with an appropriate farewell. Major D. R. Bishop, being a wise officer, sent for his company sergeant major, C. S. M. Wilson. He put the point to him, and had a prompt reply in CSM language, which being translated was, Of course you know why he's the last to leave. He's had to make up so much time spent in the nick. There was no farewell gesture, except a few well-chosen words from the CSM. The Chinese soldiers proved to be a mixed blessing. Quote, Two members of the Chinese increment were attached to training company and proved to be willing soldiers from 0700 to 1300, but thereafter lost interest as they went off to number two jobs. One lost his rifle, which was never found. Unquote. The Queen's Battalion was given some opportunity to do some patrolling up on the frontier with China. In May and June 1962, Battalion HQ and A and B companies were placed under the command of 4-8 Gurkha Brigade. They formed part of the force that took part in what was known as Operation Seal. The Chinese had opened the border, and they were attempting to flood Hong Kong with refugees, including many released criminals, in a deliberate attempt to destabilise the colony. The British Army and the Royal Hong Kong Police worked hard to capture the refugees and return them to the Chinese side of the line. This work involved intensive patrolling and guarding of the frontier. Quote, the companies were issued with radio sets, one to each section, so the platoon commanders were able to keep in touch by remote control, wrote the regimental historian. We are told that CSM Wilson and Colour Sergeant Riley did not need these modern inventions to keep in touch, as they could clearly be heard over the length of the frontier and beyond. Unquote. Two officers and ten ratings from the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal volunteered to patrol the border on attachment to the Queen's. Quote, Some soldiers thought they were balmy to inflict so much discomfort on themselves. Unquote. 
The patrol and apprehension method was simple in theory, though in practice far from so. Patrols would capture and bring Chinese into the company position, and then they were taken down the mountain in trucks to a holding camp, the railhead, and from there returned to China. Quote, we soon found out for ourselves how hard was the terrain and how exposed to the searing heat of the sun were the mountainsides, recalled the regimental historian. It did not help that you might be able to see a Chinese across a valley. By the time you had clambered down and then back up through the thorny undergrowth, he had probably gone to ground in some inaccessible thicket, and you had a tedious search on your hands. It was hot and tiring work, and your water had to be carefully conserved. Unquote. Once Operation Seal was completed, C Company remained on Hong Kong Island to train and mount guard. Lieutenant Gray took a support company to the frontier in July to man observation posts, but all was quiet. One of the greatest threats to life on the China coast is not armed military conflict, but the weather, particularly deadly typhoons. Hong Kong is regularly struck by these awesome displays of nature's power, and during the Queen's tour, Typhoon Wanda made landfall in the colony. No one at Stanley Barracks was injured, but considerable structural damage was done to the buildings and many trees blown down. Quote, Colour Sergeant Riley remembers Captain Jimmy Kemp, the quartermaster, asking him when he had last seen the company dustbins, and his reply, heading out to the China Sea, sir. On a more serious note, great damage had been done to many of the Chinese residential areas. People had been killed and injured, while others had lost their homes or their possessions. The Queens were mobilised to provide disaster relief, and also set up a fund to collect donations for the destitute training company had nearly been caught in the open up on the hills of the new territories. They had just reached the Nissan huts of Sai Kung camp when a sharp-eyed NCO spotted a typhoon warning signal flying from a special tower. The huts actually survived Wanda very well, but the windows were blown in and the camp water towers collapsed. Quote, After the storm had passed, the scene was pretty awe-inspiring. There were bits of trees everywhere and bent water pipes, gushing water in all directions." Unquote. The remainder of the Queen's Hong Kong tour was spent in exercises, both with and against the Gurkhas, sporting competitions, social activities, and A Company went back up onto the border to hunt for illegal immigrants. One hundred Territorial Army soldiers from the regiment's reserve battalion spent their annual summer camp attached to the regulars in Hong Kong, getting a taste of border soldiering and the fantastic lifestyle in the colony before boarding a 25-hour flight back to the UK. The 1960s proved to be turbulent times in Hong Kong as the events of China's Cultural Revolution spilled over the border into the territory. In 1966, there was a severe dispute concerning star ferry prices that quickly escalated into widespread rioting. On the 6th of April, the garrison was called out to patrol the streets of Kowloon with fixed bayonets and enforce a curfew. The worst trouble occurred a year later when Mao's Red Guards attempted to seriously undermine Britain's control of the colony. On the border, several Hong Kong policemen were killed during violent cross-border attacks, while communist agitators took over buildings in Hong Kong and organised an 18-month-long bombing campaign that took many lives. The army defused over 8,000 homemade bombs during this period, and the violence only came to an end when Chinese Prime Minister Zhou Enlai ordered leftists to stop, indicating just how much the violence was being orchestrated from Beijing. At one point, the People's Liberation Army Commissar Huang Yongsheng, who controlled Guangdong province bordering Hong Kong, secretly suggested invading the colony. Zhou Enlai vetoed this plan, but when Margaret Thatcher was negotiating Hong Kong's future with Deng Xiaoping in 1982, an invasion was once again secretly suggested. In all probability, such an invasion would have succeeded, with British forces having to replay the events of December 1941. The Black Watch played an important role in representing the British Army in the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997 but it was not the first time that the regiment had served in the colony. In 1972, the 1st Battalion had arrived to begin a routine three-year posting, and its experiences are representative of the roles and activities of infantry regiments in Hong Kong during the period. 
In 1972, the offensive element of the Hong Kong garrison consisted of five infantry battalions. The Black Watch was based at Gun Club Hill Barracks in Kowloon, while the 1st Battalion Irish Guards were in Stanley on Hong Kong Island. Guarding the border and providing internal security were three battalions of Gurkhas. Supporting the infantry was an armoured squadron, the 14th 20th King's Hussars, and the part-time Royal Hong Kong Regiment, the Volunteers. Mainly, it was all ceremonial, recalled Regimental Sergeant Major Bob Ritchie. We had had Hong Kong Island for a long time, and what we were really doing was showing we still had a presence in Hong Kong right up to two or three years when we'd hand it back. Ceremonial was an important part of what the British garrison in Hong Kong was all about. Quote, it was mainly all parades, Queen's birthday parades, running about with pipes and drums, military bands, and just keeping the people of Hong Kong sweet, recalled Ritchie. But there was also the equally important job of guarding the border with China. Three times a year we had to go up to the Chinese border. We were up there three weeks at a time, and we guarded all the points the trouble could flash. Traffic across the border was almost entirely one way. Nothing was leaving us to go through to the Chinese side, said Ritchie. All the Chinese wanted to come to us, to Hong Kong, because of the bright lights and everything else that Hong Kong had and mainland China didn't. The young soldiers called the border excursions snake patrols, as they walked in groups of seven or eight, often accompanied by an officer from the Royal Hong Kong Police, along the barbed wire fences that marked the frontier, and through the small villages that in some cases actually straddled the borderline. On the border we'd monitor the communist side, recalled Sergeant Ronnie Proctor, what they were doing and where they were, and sometimes one of the jobs I was in charge of, the reconnaissance platoon, and we would live in the ground and watch the North Chinese army. One location that offered both an up-close and personal look at the People's Liberation Army and a potential flashpoint was Sha Tao Kok village in the northeast of the New Territories. This settlement actually straddled the border and had a white line painted through its centre. On one side was Hong Kong and on the other Communist China. The British and Chinese had guard posts facing each other in the village and both sides mounted regular foot patrols along the frontier. As some of the observation posts we had, you could see the Chinese soldiers going about, and what they used to do recalled Private Jim Sanderlands, who had first visited Hong Kong as a Merchant Navy seaman before he joined the Black Watch in 1972. They always had sort of like green boiler suits, a green hat with a red star in the centre, and the white canvas shoes, and carrying the Russian Kalashnikov rifles. If the British observed eight or more Chinese soldiers together, the entire battalion was stood too, as a constant worry was a Chinese invasion. One day, when Sanderlands was tail end Charlie on an eight man foot patrol through Shao Tao Kok, the men passed extremely close to the border. Opposite them was a young Chinese soldier watching them intently. Quote, By this time, he's getting himself ready with a mouthful of spit, ready to draw out just to spit on me, as I'm the last man leaving, recalled Sanderlands. In the event, the Chinese soldier mistimed his assault and ended up with spit all down his tunic instead. I thought, up you, pal, said Sanderlands. The desperate people that attempted to flee China for the freedoms of Hong Kong faced perilous journeys that many did not survive, and horrific sights often greeted British troops. Many Chinese tried to enter Hong Kong by swimming over from outlying Chinese islands, particularly Ping Chau in Mears Bay, to the northeast of Hong Kong. Quote, there were quite strong currents and tides, recalled Sandlands. They would cover themselves in goose fat and various other stuff, and they'd get anything that would float like bicycle tubes, anything that was inflatable. They would strap that to them and make their way across. And many of them did, but many of them didn't. One incident in particular stuck in the minds of several Black Watch soldiers. On one occasion we had a patrol on the beach, and we actually found a body washed up on the beach, recalled Sergeant Proctor. After we found another person who was quite well, and a third one who was badly injured, and had been eaten by a shark, a helicopter was called for to take the men to hospital. The Hong Kong Auxiliary Air Force, a mostly Chinese manned reserve unit, operated the chopper. After collecting the injured Chinese, the pilot, who was low on fuel, decided to set the helicopter down at Shao Tao Kok village to refuel. Unfortunately, he landed on the wrong side of the line, in Chinese territory. 
Quote, Both sides stood too, remembered Sanderlands. Chinese troops just dragged the boy, who had been injured by a shark, out of the helicopter and left him there. And he just lay and bled to death, probably. It took a massive amount of negotiations, and I think they stripped the helicopter bare and took photographs and put it back together again before they eventually got it back a day or so later. The occupants of the helicopter, including the pilot, were badly beaten by Chinese troops, and the military personnel were only released after the British had applied intense diplomatic pressure. Incidents like this demonstrated that the border between British Hong Kong and Communist China was a place of tense Cold War rivalries and deep suspicions. It was a frontier in the West's continuing battle against communism. At the same time that British troops were guarding the Hong Kong border, their comrades were doing the same in West Berlin against the Soviet Union. On a lighter note, another important job performed by resident infantry battalions like the Black Watch was providing sentries at the white-painted government house, official residence of the governor of Hong Kong. In 1972, the governor was Samari Maklahos. An element of farce soon crept into the proceedings, as Private Sandlands recalled. The sentries at the entrance to the government house drive could not see when the governor's car was leaving because the road incorporated a blind corner and heavy foliage. Sentries had to be at the present when the governor passed through the gates, so they required some signal to warn them to present arms in time. Quote, so his chauffeur would give two toots of the horn. Knowing this was a car coming round the corner, you were up and ready saluting the governor as he drove by, said Sandlands. Comedy soon ensued. The Chinese taxi driver population all knew about this as well. So it was, every five minutes you'd hear toot toot, and you were up at the present arms, and there were some Chinese or Yank or something sticking their heads out with their camera, taking your photograph as you're giving them a salute. Unquote. At Government House on the last day of June 1997, a moving scene was played out as Governor Chris Patton watched the Union flag slowly haul down for the last time to the sound of the last post played by a Royal Hong Kong police bugler. A police, gala, a police colour guard armed with Second World War era Lee Enfield rifles performed a superb display of drill and the flag, carefully folded, was solemnly presented to Patton who bowed his head deeply. At that moment, the first drops of the day's heavy rain began to fall. Climbing into a black Rolls Royce, the gate guard presented arms for the last time, as the governor made his way down to the new convention centre for the formal handover ceremony with China. After the soldiers, sailors and airmen had paraded, the speeches had been made, the Union flag hauled down for the last time at the stroke of midnight, and Pipe Major Small had piped his haunting lament, British rule in Hong Kong had passed into history. Gathering his wife and daughters, Governor Patton had sailed away aboard the royal yacht Britannia, itself shortly to be mothballed, and for many observers it seemed that the day's dignified and sad proceedings marked the close of Britain's military relationship with the Far East. But this has not been the case. There are no more British armed forces in China, but there is still a British presence in the Far East, which may well become more significant as time passes and the region's problems become more overt. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.